Introduction to Quantum Information Processing Welcome to Lecture 4, which is about teleportation and also about the question of whether quantum states can be copied. Let's consider the problem where Alice wants to communicate a qubit to Bob, sending only classical bits. Alice receives a qubit, and based on this, she determines some classical bits to send to Bob, who was supposed to produce a qubit in the same state as the one that Alice received. Now, if Alice knows what the amplitudes of her state are, alpha 0 and alpha 1, she can send approximations of them. But this requires many bits for a good approximation and infinitely many bits for perfect precision. But it's actually much worse than that, because Alice might not know what alpha 0 and alpha 1 are. And she could try to measure her qubit, but that would actually not work out well, because then she would only receive one bit of information about the state, and she would destroy the state. So it looks very difficult. In the teleportation scenario, Alice and Bob start with an additional resource, a shared Bell state. So at the very beginning, there's a Bell state where Alice has the first qubit and Bob has the second qubit. Then Alice receives her qubit that she wants to teleport. She performs some operations, say measurements, in order to produce two classical bits, which she sends to Bob. And based on those two classical bits, Bob is supposed to produce the original state that Alice receives. This looks maybe a little bit strange, but it can be made to work. And let's analyze how teleportation works. To begin with, the initial state of the three qubit system is the following. It's a tensor product of Alice's state with the Bell state. And if we expand the tensor product, then it's the sum of four terms. It's an eight-dimensional vector, because there are three qubits involved. Here I've just recopied the state. It's that eight-dimensional vector. And um, I've omitted the 1 over root 2 factor, just to reduce clutter. This expression is equal to the following four-line expression. And by understanding this relationship and this four-line expression, we're going to get a good understanding of how teleportation can be made to work. So first of all, why are they actually equal? Because we have an expression involving a superposition of four kets. And if we expanded all the tensor products in the four lines, we would get four kets for each line. So there would actually be 16 terms. So how is four terms equal to 16 terms? Well, if you look at what's highlighted on the slide, the ket zero, 0 term with amplitude alpha 0 actually corresponds to two terms in the expanded uh, tensor product, because we have an alpha 0 times ket zero, 0 times a half, and another half times alpha 0 ket zero, 0, 0. And similarly for the other three terms. So that would account for eight of the terms in the four-line expression, two terms for each of the kets in the top line. What about the other eight? Well, if you look at the expression, you see that there's some cancellation. We have a ket 1, 1, 0 with amplitude alpha 0, and then we have a ket 1, 1, 0 with amplitude minus alpha 0. So you get cancellations like this, and one would need to work through the details, but they are actually equal. The next question is, if they are equal, how is this useful to be able to express it this way? Well, there's something remarkable about this expression, because at the beginning, the first qubit 
is what contains the interesting information, the uh, alpha 0 and the alpha 1. But if you look at this four-line expression, you see that the alpha 0 and alpha 1, they're associated with the third qubit, which is on Bob's side. So it's almost like before Alice and Bob even did anything, somehow the, um, the coefficients alpha 0 and alpha 1 have migrated over to Bob's side. Now, Bob doesn't actually have any information about the qubit. There's no contradiction, because with all the cancellation and everything, all the information is essentially washed out. So Bob doesn't have any information about Alice's qubit, even if we write the state this way. But it's still useful to look at the state this way, because let's look at the first line of the four-line expression. In that line, Alice's two qubits are in a Bell state, and Bob's qubit is in the state that Alice wants to teleport. So if that were the state, then they would be done. Let's look at the second line. There, Alice has a different Bell state, and Bob doesn't quite have the state that he's supposed to have. It's not quite the qubit, because um, the ones and the zeros are flipped. But if Bob were to apply a poly x gate, then that would turn the state into alpha 0, ket 0, plus alpha 1, ket 1. The third line, again, Alice has a bell state, and Bob has a slightly uh, modified version of the state. And in this case, the correction could be achieved by applying a poly z gate. And in the fourth line, Alice has the fourth bell state, and the correction on Bob's side would be to apply a poly x and a poly z. But the state isn't one of those four lines. It's the superposition of those four lines. But it suggests an idea for achieving teleportation. Alice could measure her two qubits in the Bell basis, and that would cause the state to collapse to one of the four lines and Alice would know which line it collapsed to. Okay, And she sends two bits to Bob to indicate which line it collapsed to. And based on that information, Bob knows which correction to apply to get the right state. So that's, that's teleportation. That's essentially how it works. Let's go through this in more detail. What Alice does specifically is she applies this combination of circuits, this controlled knot and Hadamard gate, to her two qubits. And what that does is it converts the Bell basis into the computational basis. Because that's how you measure in the Bell basis. You convert it to the computational basis, and then you do a standard measurement. And then Alice measures the two qubits. Those are the two measurement gates. And that causes the state to collapse to one of these four possibilities. And on Alice's side, there are now two classical bits. And on Bob's side, there is the collapsed part of the state. And then Alice sends her two classical bits to Bob, who can adjust his qubit so that it's alpha 0, ket 0, plus alpha 1, ket 1 in all four cases. OK, just as an aside here, Alice is performing one of those it's actually quite an exotic measurement that Alice is performing because she has the one qubit, which is the alpha 0, ket 0, plus alpha 1, ket 1, the qubit that she wants to teleport. But she's not doing a simple one qubit measurement. But actually it's being combined with a bell state as an ancillary pair of qubits. One qubit is in Alice's possession and the other is in Bob's. And then Alice performs a unitary on the first two qubits, and then measures. And just to be more detailed about what Bob does, he's got to do the appropriate correction. So he receives two classical bits from Alice, A and B. And B indicates whether Bob should apply a poly X, and A indicates whether Bob should apply a poly Z. And if you apply the operations in the four cases, you see that it's always the appropriate correction. So Bob obtains the correct state in all four cases.
Here is a circuit that summarizes the teleportation protocol. Alice's qubits and bits are on top, and Bob's are on the bottom. You can see from the slanted wires that the two classical bits resulting from Alice's measurements are being shifted down from Alice towards Bob. You should be able to work through the circuit diagram to check that it works. Here's a question. Does Alice preserve her copy of the state? You may pause to think about this. Okay, since Alice measures her qubits, all the quantum information in her possession is lost. So, although Bob ends up with a copy of the state, Alice loses her copy of the state in the teleportation process. Another question is, is there any way to get the second copy of Alice's state? Maybe the teleportation can be modified so that Alice doesn't lose her copy of the state. Or perhaps there's an altogether different way of getting two copies of a state. What do you think? Next, we'll explore this question of copying quantum states. And let's start with the classical case where we want to copy classical information. So here's a trivial kind of copier that copies just one bit of information. So there's a bit that's 0 or 1, and we want to produce two copies of that bit. What goes in is another bit whose initial state is 0, and you can kind of think of that bit as like the blank piece of paper that goes into a photocopier. And at the end, that piece of paper should have the same information as the, uh, as the other data. Um, so you should get two copies of whatever the bit A is at the end. Can you see what gate you would perform to do this? Yeah, a controlled NOT gate in the classical setting that produces two copies of the state A. So that's a classical copier. We know classical information can be copied. I, I back up my files all the time. What about quantum information? So now we have a qubit in state psi, which is an arbitrary state. And then we have another qubit in state ket0, which plays the role of the blank sheet of paper going into a copier. And we want to perform some unitary operation such that the output is two copies of the state, Psi. Can we do that? Well, here's a candidate copier. Let's try the control NOT gate again and see if it works. Let's start as a sanity test, see if it at least works for computational basis states. If it's uh, the state is ket0, then you do end up with two copies of ket0. And for ket1, yeah, you also end up with two copies of ket1. So this works for computational basis states. It'll produce two copies of a computational basis state. What about other states? Let's try the plus and minus states. What happens with the plus state? the plus state and ket0, you apply a controlled NOT gate, what do you get? Well, you get a bell state. And is that two copies of the plus state? Nope. Because two copies of the plus state is this, and that's just a uniform superposition of all four computational basis states of two qubits, and that's not a bell state. So, nope, it doesn't work. And in fact, there is no unitary operation. I mean, that's just one example of a unitary that doesn't work, but there is no two qubit unitary U that works. And this is actually quite easy to prove. It's, I think it's going to be two lines, the proof. So, if U was a qubit copier, 
then of course it would have to send cat0 cat0 to cat0 cat0 and it would have to send cat1 cat0 to cat1 cat1 because it would have to copy for the case of computational basis states and therefore by linearity on the plus state it has to produce a bell state which is not two copies of the plus state so it's almost like the uh, analysis that we gave for the controlled not gate although it's it's uh, it's not really assuming that it's a controlled not gate but that's the proof of the theorem maybe that's too restrictive of what a copier is because we could imagine a copier where the scenario is a little bit more complicated where the first qubit is the the qubit that we want to copy the second qubit well it plays the role of the blank piece of paper that's supposed to end up in uh, in a copy of state psi and let's say we have another state which is a third state which is some kind of resource state uh, think of it as like the toner in a copier where it's a resource that you consume in the process of copying and suppose that the output was two copies of psi and the state of the, the well the toner would be changed it would be in some state that i'm just calling a junk state where the actual state could depend on what psi was and therefore you couldn't recycle it if you wanted to copy again because we don't really know what the state is so we can't easily reset it to zero so this is a more generous model of a copier and what do you think do you think that this kind of copier might be possible so you get two copies of the input data and then you have some additional information to discard actually even that's impossible but the proof is a little harder than the two-line proof not much harder so I'll leave it as an exercise to prove that even this kind of copier is not possible now we're nearing the end of part one to summarize classical states are probability vectors whereas quantum states are amplitude vectors which are vectors whose length is one for quantum states, we have initialize and measure operations. We also have unitary operations, which enable us to measure the qubits in our possession in different coordinate systems. For classical states, subsystems are straightforward as probability vectors, whereas for quantum states, subsystems do not always have amplitude vectors. Now, when I say quantum states are amplitude vectors, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence because there are equivalences. For example, ket0 plus ket1 is the same state as minus ket0 minus ket1 because they differ only by a global phase. We can also incorporate our normalization convention into our equivalence relation. That way, any two non-zero vectors are deemed equivalent if and only if there is a complex number C such that one vector is C times the other vector. Notice that we can visualize the equivalence classes geometrically as lines that pass through the origin. This is an object widely studied in mathematics called the projective space. Starting with the space c to the d d-dimensional vectors with the equivalence relation we end up with a projective space called p to the d minus one we are now at the end of part one in part three on quantum information theory we'll see a different language for describing quantum states that's in a certain sense more expressive before that comes part two, which is about quantum algorithms.